Before we get started, I would like to disclose the fact that I am using an AI voice changer because I absolutely despise my own voice. So a huge thank you to Eleven Lads for allowing this to become a possibility. Pokemon Legends Arceus is easily one of the best games in the franchise. In my opinion, I would place it in my top three, right behind Explorers of Sky and just before Shadows of Almia. But we could be here all day talking about this game. That's not what this is about. We're here because, well, as the title suggests, I have subjected myself to a highly difficult Nuzlocke-style run in this game, not once, but twice. Yep, that's right, twice. I'll did a permadeath run in this game that was so brutal, so exhilarating, and such an emotional roller coaster of an adventure that I decided to do what any sane person would and do it again. Although, this time, Rather than wish I had the patience and dedication to document my journey as a YouTube video, I am actually doing it. There was a lot I learned from the first run I did, and a lot of notes I took on how to improve the challenge rules, as well as how I could go about approaching it a second time around. The permadeath rules are strict, but adding the monochrome rules on top of it served to make it even more so. Now, before I get into the real meat and potatoes of the run, I of course have to talk about the rules. If you ever wanted to try this run for yourself, then you have to know how it works, right? And hey, just as a side note, I would absolutely love to hear your experience should you ever do this too. So without further ado, here are the rules of the run. First and foremost, the run begins after the three catch tutorial at the beginning of the game and finishes after the end game battle against Volo. However, if you are a very dedicated player, you could take it all the way to the final Arceus battle. You can also pick whichever starter you'd like. Rule number two. Upon entering any new area, you're allowed to add up to five new Pokemon to your team. It doesn't matter where or when you catch them, since some places can only be accessed later on in the game, and you can return to capture them at that time. However, due to this, you will need to be strategic about which Pokemon you capture for your team and when. As clarification, an area refers to a map, so the Obsidian Fieldlands, Crimson Mirelands, Cobalt Coastlands, Coronate Highlands, and Alabaster Icelands. Therefore, you will have a total of 25 usable Pokémon from these places for your entire run. Rule number three, aside from the five usable Pokémon per area, you can of course also use your starter. You can also use one Pokémon captured in each space-time distortion. You cannot use Alpha Pokemon unless you caught that Pokemon in a space-time distortion. Legendary and Mythical Pokemon are not allowed. You cannot use Gift Pokemon, Traded Pokemon, or any other Pokemon received from outside of the game. You can use Pokemon received from quests, but they will count as a catch for that area. Rule number four. The Shiny Clause states that if you encounter a Shiny Pokemon, you may use it even if you're allowed five Pokemon for one area has already been used up. However, this clause does not apply to the guaranteed Shiny Ponyta. It does not apply to mass outbreaks either. Rule number five. You may only have up to six active team members at one time. This means that you cannot train up more than six Pokemon at one time and switch between them in your pastures. The only time you're allowed to switch between party members is for temporary quests, such as bringing a certain Pokemon to someone, or when a party member dies. Rule number six. As is customary, fainting equals death. Once a Pokemon faints, it is dead, and therefore cannot be used anymore for the run. These Pokemon must be placed in the pasture for the rest of the game, and cannot be used for quests either, such as showing them for to a villager, sending them to a farm, etc. You should ideally use Pasture 8 for your team's graveyard. Pasture 6 and 7 can be used to separate out the 5 Pokémon per area and any Pokémon cutting distortions. This isn't mandatory, but it is highly recommended to better organize Pokémon and not lose count amongst the several other Pokémon needed to capture for quests and ranking up. Rule 7. Throughout the run, you yourself are given 3 lives. If you die while out in the field or during a noble battle, then a life is automatically used up. You will lose the run if, after your final life is used up, you die while out in the field or during a noble battle. In the unlikely event that you land the Faishin Balm and a noble at the exact same time that you black out, this is not counted as a life lost. However, you must select one Pokemon from your team to sacrifice in your stead. Now, 
I know this sounds like a very weirdly specific thing to add in as a rule, but the reason that this exists is because it actually happened to me during my first permadeath run. I had no idea what to do in this kind of situation, so I had no choice but to make it into a rule using the help of ChatGPT. Anyways, you are allowed to restart a noble or boss battle without penalty only if the cause of your loss was technical or bug related, such as Joy-Con Drift. But please, be honest and do not use this opportunity to cheat. You're only ruining it for yourself. Rule number eight, you can only save the game in Jubilife Village, the Ancient Retreat, or at base camps. However, if you fast travel to a camp, you're not allowed to save there. You are allowed to return to your last save point three times during the run. However, you cannot use this before noble battles or boss battles, with the exception of the post-game Volo fight. Rule number nine, you can use any item in the game except for revives. You are allowed to use Shrine Charms, Evolutionary Items, Great Items, and Learn or Master Moves with Zisu. You can use Mints and Form Changing Items as long as they are all obtained within the game. Rule number 10. Understandably, it is almost impossible to have empty party slots due to captured Pokémon automatically filling up those slots. However, you are not allowed to use these Pokémon for battling or gathering items unless you are adding them to your active party. You must remove or replace them as soon as possible. Since the run starts after the three mandatory catches at the start of the game, they do not count towards your five Pokemon for the Obsidian Fieldlands unless you choose to use them. Once a Pokemon is sent out into battle or to gather any item, it will become a member of your team whether you intended it or not. To prevent this from happening, send any Pokemon you do not wish to be a member of your team into the pastures as soon as possible. So those are the basic permadeath nuzlocke rules. However, there are some tips I would like to share. Number one, save your great items for the late game. Using them on Pokemon who are at least level 50 is ideal, so that items aren't wasted. Same goes for purchasing moves at Zisir's place. Number two, wait until you have four pastures filled to release any Pokemon. This ensures that you will unlock the mass release function. Number three, don't use your three return to saves until you reach the end game. Ideally, they should be saved for the post-game Volo battle. But if a key member of your team dies right before it and it isn't a Pokemon that is obtainable anymore, use it then. Number four, buy the survival charm and the warding charm from the Arceus Shrine to keep you from dying out in the field. Number five, feel free to further add to the run's difficulty by combining it with other challenges, such as Monotype, Rainbow, One Color, Single Gen, Soul Lock, etc. And finally, it also helps to keep a journal of your daily events to go back and reread later. Bonus points if you utilize a personal Discord server and log audio messages at the run. So then, that leads into the next set of rules to be layered on top of the primitive rules. The monochrome rules. It's quite simple. You can only use Pokemon that are colored black, white, and gray. Now, Pokemon, of course, has its own official color classification system, but it's not exactly the most reasonable system. So we will be using some basic common sense to kind of adjust the Pokemon allowed and disallowed. For example, Snorlax for some reason is classified as black when it's obviously blue, so we won't be using that. Hisui and Zorua and Zoroark are white, but for some reason aren't classified as such, so they will be allowed. Gallade is somehow classified as white while Gardevoir isn't, despite it having more white on its body, so it is technically allowed, but I'm not sure how I feel about it. The Starmie line and Geodude and Graveler are all grayscale in color, so they are allowed, but Munchlax, Rhyperior, Probopass, Machop, and Snorunt are not, so they cannot be used. Basically, if its body is at least 75% white, black, or gray, it passes the monochrome classification in my books. So now, with all of that out of the way, without further ado, we can finally get into the Pokemon Legends Arceus Permadeath Nuzlocke Monochrome Challenge Run. So the very first thing I had to do was to delete my old save file. So, uh, sorry history, you've been destroyed return to nothing, return to ashes, just like Volo intended. The first two times I played through this game, I named my player character Red, so I wanted to do something a little differently this time. I thought, 
Who could I name my character after this time? Someone iconic, a legend. Someone like Cynthia, of course. That is the perfect choice. Arceus has sent Cynthia back in time to stop her deranged ancestor from destroying the world of Hisui. And for one reason or another, she can only use Pokemon that are white, black, and gray. Totally not a Gen 5 reference, guys, I swear. So we fell from the sky, woke up on the beach, just like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky, met the professor, and went through all of the tutorial stuff before we could actually finally get into where the run begins. So, we met Silene, lightning came down from the sky, yada yada yada, picked the starter, not like it matters because we can't use it anyway, finally got to battle against our great 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 grandfather, went out to the field lands, caught the three Pokemon, joined the Delixie team, and finally we could get started. So the first part of this was actually a lot more tedious than expected. I spent a lot of time looking for a Starly that had a good nature, but unfortunately all of them were pretty terrible. I eventually just settled on these two Starly, Winter, and Breeze, and I decided to add them to my party. These are going to be the first two catches for the entirety of the field lands, so I gotta be really careful from here on out. Oh god damn it, Rain wants to battle and he has a Pikachu, and he just knocked out my Starly, so, well, that's great. After getting jump scared by Volo, we head back into the Obsidian field lands with nothing but a single level 10 Starly in the party. I can tell you I was not feeling confident whatsoever, as a matter of fact, I was terrified. Leveling up was a chore, and I had no idea what I was going to do, until I stumbled upon gold. And thus, I began to decimate the local beautified population, until I was strong enough to challenge mine. And I think I might have been just a little bit overleveled for this battle. Then, I added a Geodude to my team, who promptly got one shot, so I ran off in search of another one. I ended up catching a couple more, thus completing my 5 catches for the entirety of the Obsidian Fieldlands. I decided to train them by fighting off a whole bunch of Drifblim, which really paid off because my Staraptor evolved into Staravia and my two Geodudes evolved into two Gravelers. But I got a little too cocky when I decided to challenge a Luxury, and it knocked out my Graveler with just a couple of HP left somehow. So I went out to the Heartwood and decided to challenge Lian, and well, this is how it went. Then I met this really cool Silver Deer, who I unfortunately cannot use for my run because it would require having a Statler use Psy Shield Bash 20 times. And I can't because Scantler is a brown Pokemon, unfortunately. But I did get to play my food for it, so that was pretty funky. But I'm finally ready to take out the frenzied cleaver and just get this over with so that we can finally meet the best character in the game. We battled Ray again and finally got the Crimson Mire Lambs and Space Time Distortions unlocked. So the next order of business is to catch myself in Umbreon in one of these distortions. But after visiting three distortions with no luck, I decided to just do some training and catch myself a Murkrow instead. Which ended up being a really good idea because I was able to wipe Volo's team with it. From then onward, it was relatively smooth sailing with a hell of a lot of good luck. I got an Umbreon in my fourth space-time distortion, got the wall fragment, even managing to catch an elusive Toldetic. The dream team was coming together, and I had high hopes for the rest of the Crimson Mire lands. I caught a couple of unknowns, and then added a Pachirisu and a Togepi to my roster for the last two catches for the Crimson Mire lands. Then I had an extremely close call when my dad started wiping the television because he thought the black marks at the corners were some sort of dirt. So all these Pokemon gained up on me and I almost died, but I luckily made it with just a little bit of health to spare. I did have a survival charm, so even if I would have been hit, Arceus would have saved me. The Stunky battle went surprisingly well. 
the Ursaluda battle did not. But Breeze took care of it, and then I got to play my flute again. Yeah, so anyway, Roxanne got benched, and I totally did not do that on purpose to have more type diversity and add this adorable little bunch of Risu to my team. I big look at her, look at her, she's so cute. So I ranked up, and now I have to go find my wife, I mean a Rezu, because she's gone missing. So I already knew where she was since I've already done this a couple of other times, and after this was pretty uneventful. I went straight to the Lady of the Ridge to go quell her because I'm already massively overleveled and it's kind of not fun facing off against wild Pokemon when I'm this high level, especially because I don't even gain much XP from it. I really just want to get to the Cobalt Coastlands as soon as possible. So, with Willigant calmed down, we get to sit through a bunch of dialogue and appreciate Arezu because Arezu is best girl. It's time to head back to the village, where absolutely no one suspicious will be standing there waiting to greet us. Well, Arezu lives here now, and I just realized these guys have really funny names. We made it to the coastlands, baby. Next, we have to battle Irida, but uh... Yeah, I don't really think I have anything to worry about. No freaking way I have the wrong Pokemon in my first party slot. Dude, and Pop was so beefed up too. I mean, look at all of the great items I gave her. How could this happen? This is so stupid. Ugh, so anyways, continuing on with the story. Thank goodness for fast travel because I got stuck on this little ledge here. I needed to get myself over to a space-time distortion so I could catch myself a Magnemite. And can we just take a moment to appreciate how creepy the music is in these things? So I found a Magnemite, but Dark Feigned got a little too enthusiastic and killed it! I ended up just catching a bunch of Pokemon to try and increase my rank and gather some great items, and then I went back to the Obsidian Fieldlands to do a bunch of training. While I was there, a space-time distortion spawned, and I accidentally gave a Sylveon a concussion. So I caught this cool Gyarados, get some more training, and managed to evolve Meow Meow. Now I need to raise up the friendship levels on my Togetic so that I could hopefully evolve him into a Togekiss. Everything was running smoothly, too smoothly so smoothly that I completely forgot to be cautious. And right when I least expected it, that's when tragedy struck. Floofs was gone. I couldn't believe it. I was left devastated, speechless. How could this have happened? Where the hell did this Luxray even come from? Why? How could they take him from us? How could they do this to Floofs? But I knew right then and there that I would not let his sacrifice be in vain. Nobody on my team would. And so we added vengeance, a Rhydon that I captured in the space-time distortion in the Cobalt Coastlands. And we moved onwards. Oh well, yeah, and uh, Pop too. I kind of forgot about her, not gonna lie. So, day 10. We went back out to the coastlines to do a bunch of training. We almost added a Star Raptor to the team, but it knocked itself out. Pecha was a little too enthusiastic, I think. We're supposed to go catch some spooky ghosts in order to prepare the proper food for Basque Legion, but on the way there, um, hey, wait a minute. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? The food has been acquired, but on the way to the shore, I encountered some really glitchy glam yow. It's really interesting to me because when I was a kid and I played Explorers of Sky, there was a really glitchy glam yow who looked more like a missing no. I actually managed to add it to my team and named it Missing No. I think something to do with the distortion of space and time is affecting these glam yow personally. Sure enough, a space-time distortion formed. 
And as it turns out, these things actually stick around for cutscenes as well. So everything looked pretty cool during this whole sequence. This time, I was able to catch a Magnemite in the distortion, as well as pick up a metal coat. Later on, I managed to catch a Honchkrow. So I have a pretty good roster of Pokemon sure anything happened to the ones on my team in the future. With all that out of the way, it was time to get on the fish and start heading out to Fire Spit Island. So we passed the Seizure Forest, almost got softlocked for some reason, and after a space-time distortion dissipated, found some invisible sleeping Pokemon. Arceus saved me after this artillery flamethrowered me because apparently they can do that and this Skorupi bit me at the exact same time just to make matters worse. Seriously, why were the coastlines so glitchy and brutal? But I was not prepared for just how much more brutal it was about to get. I was screaming at the TV because I know for a fact I did not have vengeance in the first party slot. I had doomed there, but apparently I messed up and then she got one shot but I didn't even have a chance to process it because I have to fight all three bandit sisters back to back and then Charm has the audacity to send out a Gengar that outspeeds and kills Doom. And I still haven't even done the noble battle yet? Dude, I haven't even had a chance to put together footage for a sad death montage for these two. I was stunned, devastated, but there was no time to be because I had a noble to quell. Before the battle, I headed to a space-time destruction to catch myself another Magnemite. Then I headed up to the beachside camp to lay my two fallen comrades to rest. I added Honchkrow and the new Magnemite to my team and headed off to quell the noble. I was gonna defeat him. I was gonna... Yeah, my, my head was not in the game. Ah, it was at this point that I reluctantly had to use one of my return to last saves. I didn't want to use up a life, so I resorted to just doing this. I lost a lot of progress, I didn't get to keep the Magnemite I had caught in the space-time distortion, but luckily I still had an extra one, so I took that new one and the Honchkrow, gathered myself together, and this time I defeated the Noble easily. With a couple more casualties, unfortunately. So, I had to take a few days off from playing because the Joy-Con drift was getting really bad. I went ahead and bought myself a new set of controllers and I was good to go for the Coronet Highlands. So, I really love the Coronet Highlands, but you know what I don't love? This guy. I freaking hate this guy. I hate Melee with every fiber of my being. I hate him. I despise him. I hate every single interaction with this idiot of a person. Oh yeah, I almost forgot the funny train man is here. So we followed Ingo through this really dark cave. Totally didn't get lost or anything like that. Eventually made our way outside and got a whole bunch of training in in preparation for the battle against the insufferable man-child that is Smelly Melly. Seriously, man's got the whole squad cheering. Yeah, woohoo, Melly, wow. I looked him dead in the eye as I reminded him who the champion is around here and then followed Grandpa Rayo Fan farther down the way. Now, this is normally the part where you battle Ingo in order to get access to Smeasler, but who needs a sassy Ice Weasel when you can just Skyrim horse your way up the cliffs anyway? I bypassed the battle and immediately got access to the entirety of the Coronet Highlands. I caught the shield on in a space-time distortion, caught a shiny Bronzor, found a shiny stone, caught a flying Magazoon, made it to the Celestical Ruins, all without the need of Sneasler. I got a bunch more training in and I was on top of the world. To make matters even better, I maxed out the friendship on my Togepi so I was able to evolve it into a Togetic. And since I had found the shiny stone earlier, I could immediately evolve him into a Tovikiss. I was going to take superb care of Pixie Sticks after what happened to Floops. So now we're on day 13, and I think this is a good place to note something about the base camp saving rule. In the post game, the summit camp is located right here. Since there's no other nearby base camp, you are still allowed to save here even if you haven't unlocked the summit camp yet. Well, sadly, it was at this point when my luck had run out. This was seriously the most aggravating loss I've had so far. I could say it was my fault, but I mean, look, come on. I hated having to say goodbye to Meow Meow so soon. I never should have taken this risk. I know I could have won that, but it was my fault for not thinking better on this. She was a valuable team member with a very diverse move pool, and I hate to see her go to the pasture in the sky, 
But what can we do but move forward? Anyways, back to the harsh reality. I caught him a choke, did some more training, and had this extremely close call with a Gligar that outsped and landed a critical hit on Dark Fane. I did not want to lose another party member at this time, so I figured I was just gonna go ahead and head back to Jubilife Village. I caught a lot of stuff, added the Machoke to my roster, and ranked up. I still had to battle Ingo, so I needed to make sure I was well prepared for that. So I spiffed up my team's moves and started to make my way back up to the port at Highlands after leaving poor old grandpa standing alone in the snow for three days straight. Poor thing. So anyway, the battle against Ingo went pretty well and Pixie Sticks got his first chance at a battle and he killed it, literally. Also, Funny Train Man did the Funny Train pose. Guys, look, he's doing it. Anyways, we finally met Sneasler, so you know what that means. It was time for round two with Smelly Melly the Manchild, and once again, I did not need Sneasler's help for ascending these clips. Melly did not play fair, but I was actually doing relatively well, and Petra was doing some pretty good damage on Skunk Tape. I had this in the bag. There was nothing a level 22 Pokemon could do against my level 54 one. And then what about the freaking idiot does? Freaking strong style, you know, short walk you with this. What is this? What are you with the hell? Oh, get this freaking dude out of here. Hit him. I hate him. I hate him. I freaking hate him. I don't do all this. I freaking hate him. I freaking end up this all freaking stupid. Ah, uh, I don't have death montage footage and I'm probably going to stop doing them because it takes up way too much time on the video. But yeah, I'm pretty upset about this. Catch you'll have to go to the pasture in the sky with Meow Meow. Despite this, I was still in a relatively okay position with plenty of Pokemon to switch out to. Before the Electrode battle, I wanted to switch gears a little and head out to the Obsidian Fieldlands for some side quests. While there, I encountered a space-time discussion and an extremely aggressive tree. And to my surprise, I encountered a modern-day Sneasel, which I can't use for my run. For now, though, I settled on the Great Cornelius as a replacement for Pecha. It was time for the Electrode battle, and Dark Fanged absolutely carried. I actually managed to win pretty easily, but pay attention to something that happens right here. See that ball of lightning that emerges from Electro just before he's taken down? Well, that's what I meant when I said that you could go down at the exact same time as the Noble. And that is exactly what happened to me in my previous permadeath run. So Electrode was down and- No, I got out of here, I hate you! So, we're going to the Icelands, the last area of the game, to quell the fifth and final noble. However, we have to face off against Reagan, but that's no issue for the great Cornelius. Also, Happy New Year, it's 2024 and I am still in this godforsaken place. We had a space-time distortion spawn in relatively quickly and got absolutely annihilated in there. It was a close call and I didn't even get anything good from it. Regardless, the Icelands are full of Pokemon that are perfect for the monochrome run. I quickly filled up my Iceland catches with an Obama Snow, Sneasel, Zornoa, Glalie, and left the fifth slot open for the quest Alolan Vulpix. I'm also thinking of just replacing Sneasel for the quest Frostlass, since there's already a Sneasel in my lineup. I've also still got two catches left for the Coronet Highlands, but I'm leaving those open for replacement Magnezones. Training has consisted of decimating the local Glalie population, via Swole's Match Punch and Pixie Sticks' Flamethrower. I also went into another space-time distortion, but all I found in there was disappointment, existential dread, and more glitches. During the battle with the weird shirtless guy, he somehow managed to attack four times in a row, but thankfully my instinct told me to use Calm Mind beforehand, so nothing happened to Dark Fang, and we actually got through the battle pretty easily. So we met up with Sabi and did some more training, I was really trying to grind for great dust to give to Cornelius. Well, you wouldn't believe it. But while I was trying to get some cool footage for this video, I made the worst mistake imaginable. Dude, you gotta be freaking kidding me. There is no way. There is no freaking way. 
dude, come on, come on. It's seriously, are you serious? How, how does this, ha oh my God, dude. What the heck did I do? Why am I so stupid? What? How could I, I literally lost a life in the dumbest way possible? Oh my God. And if I return to last save, I will lose an entire hour of progress. An entire freaking hour of progress. I just need to take the L here. I need to take the L. I lost a life. I lost so many good items. Holy crap. Dang it. So after that unceremonious death, I no quipped into the back rooms or something to get my ass kicked by a little girl. And seriously, what is it with these people not playing fair? Why are they always allowed to send out three Pokemon, but I can only ever send out one? So anyways, Rafe died and Swole died, so I have to send out Dark Fang and Cornelius to finish the battle. Noble sacrifices indeed. I still get to battle Braviary, but that was a piece of cake. Then this guy showed up for some reason, and we finally got access to this really cool but incredibly difficult to control bird. Literally just put me on the freaking wedge Braviary, how hard is it? Come on, just seriously, look at this. Why is it it should not be this difficult to put me on a ledge? Come on, Braviary, all we need to do is desecrate a grave in the name of cannibalism. Oh, and if you thought for one second I wasn't gonna make a joke about the final flute sequence, well, then you'd be right, because I'm saving my breath for the man upstairs. I headed back to the village, put Wraith and Swole in the pastures, and added a Zoroa and a Sneasel to my team. The Zoroa quickly evolved into a Zoroark. Aside from training the new recruits, I wanted to rank up and gather a whole bunch of supplies in preparation for the upcoming calamity. And what better place to go than the Crimson Mirelands? Since I didn't get a chance to enjoy it the first time around since my Pokemon were too overleveled, I thought this would be a great place to train up my new team members. So I visited a couple of space-time distortions and managed to catch another Umbreon. I spent a good hour and a half training up Edgelord and Razor, and I was actually having quite a lot of fun. That is, until I made a grave mistake that cost Edgelord his life, and I cannot begin to express just how frustrated this made me. An entire hour and a half of progress right down the drain. Anyways, no matter, I figured that my saving grace would be to catch that Frostlass from the quest, only to find out that you can't actually couch the Frostlass, you have to defeat it, you have no choice, so I wasted all my time doing that. So I just gave up on trying to train. I had already wasted enough time already. And since I still haven't decided on my Iceland roster, I decided to catch this Machoke and I also caught another Zorua. There would be plenty of time to train during the end game and post game, so I decided to just head on and defeat the final noble. And I really needed to hurry because that apocalypse was already starting to make itself known. So, I evolved her and trained her a little, as she will be playing the unfortunate yet heroic role of being a sacrifice during the Avalug battle. And this was it. We could only hope and pray that everything would turn out alright. Strong was doing a very good job and she carried for a large portion of the battle, until she finally fulfilled her duty. Hats off to her. I unfortunately kept taking hits faster than I could dodge, so I ended up losing a second life. Not good. But I finally quailed the noble, and then set off to enjoy what would be the final sunrise this world would see for a long time. Stock and meat for the apocalypse, doodle it doo, we're all gonna die. At long last, we will be able to return to our normal lives. We, we will be able to return to our normal lives, right? Yeah, so we sort of screwed up, and the world is kinda ending, and everyone's a little bit pissed off, and now we're getting kicked out of the village, so yeah. My wife won't talk to me anymore, my Rotom dealer won't even look at me anymore, and Silene is making me do the walk of shame out of the village. But at least she secretly cares about us, right? And also huge props to this lady who cannot be bothered and straight up does not care. Who else out there would possibly want to help us? The Pearl Clan said no, the Diamond Clan wants nothing to do with us. But just as all hope was lost, 
we got saved by none other than our great 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 grandfather who just conveniently happened to be of the area and knew exactly where to find us but wait there's more more cynthia that is because apparently we have a great 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 who knows how many greats immortal grandma living out in the middle of nowhere here and she's just absolutely wonderful and now with our proper family reunion out of the way it was time to decide which clan would aid us on the rest of our journey and i would pick adamin in a heartbeat i mean come on we all know that adamin is the best here but i went with eriga because i really don't want to face the honest and plus it gives my mortal enemy one less thing to gloat about we can finally buy stuff from Volo now, so I made sure to sell him $70,000 worth of stuff so he can pay me back for all the pain and suffering he's going to cause me. We went to therapy, reported back to Immortal Grandma, Volo got roasted, and we went to the Crimson Mirelands. We threw rocks in a deity, and Grandma gave us a pat on the back and a cookie. Did I mention how much I love her? Seriously. Um, moving on. I have to go back to the Icelands for the final deity but I wanted to train beforehand. The outcomes of these final endgame battles will determine how the rest of the Nuzlocke plays out. And once again, we need to appreciate how creepy the music is in space-time distortions. And then I almost died again, so I decided to quit messing around and go play trivia with Yuxi instead. With all three trials done, we meet at the Shrouded Ruins, assembled the Red Chain, and are ready to save the world. Our team at this point consists of Breeze the Starraptor, Darkfeind the Umbreon, Cornelius the Magnezone, Pixie Sticks the Toldekiss, Maelstrom the Zoroark, and Razor the Smeasel and Zoroark and Smeasel are nowhere near prepared for the battles that lie ahead. But hey, at least we don't have to see our mortal enemy ever again. Oh my god, Melly, where did you come from? Where are you doing? You know what invited you? Go away, you stupid idiot. I hate you. Well, I just need to take a quick and uneventful walk before the battle, and oh my gosh, a level 70 Alpha Dusclops? And I can actually use this for my run because it's both grayscale and an Alpha caught in the space-time distortion. I cannot tell you how many max potions I had to spam on my star after while chucking ultra balls every chance I got until it finally stayed but holy hell look at this beast now that's what I call luck but alas it was time for the biggest betrayal thus far oh geez still alive and kicking time we got rid of you once and for all what kind of stuff to say is this and now he's an edgy ninja dude who looks like a mix of Wally of the shadow triad Damn wannabe Naruto looking ass. So Dark Fang takes out Miss Magius. Sneasler somehow attacks three times in a row, but we take him out too. The Great Cornelius defeats Gardevoir, but then Gallade kills Cornelius? No, not Cornelius, dude. Not the Great Cornelius. I'm literally so sad. What a champ. But anyway, Breeze killed Gallade, and with that, we had defeated Benny and he drops his tragic backstory on us, but I don't care because I'm still sad about Cornelius. I also think it's funny that immediately afterwards, if you go back to Jubilife Village, he's just standing right there. I'd like to imagine that he just trudges back home behind us and decides to go back to making food instead of beating up children in a cave. Anyways, I found a razor claw and evolved Sneasel into Weavile. And look at her, she's so adorable with her little face. I took a detour to go through some satchel hunting and farmed enough MP to get myself a Reaper Cloth. So now I have a Dusk Noir. It's just like Explorers of Sky for real. And by some absolute miracle, I found a level 77 Alpha Stuix in another distortion in the Obsidian Fieldlands, which again I can use for my run since it's grayscale and caught in a distortion. Look at this tank! So naturally, Duskmoor was taking Cornelius' slot in my party, and I named him Calamity. We finally headed up for the next major endgame battle against Kamado. I completely forgot his entire team aside from Snorlax, so this will be fun. He led with Braviary, which I knocked out with Breeze and Razor. But then Snorlax outsped upon entering the battlefield and killed Razor. I was so mad, so I sent out Calamity to deal with him. Then Pixie Sticks made quick work of Clefable. So now I just needed to head up to the Temple of Sinnoh and beat the non haunts Palkia into submission. So I'll just head on back to the training grounds with Zisu, and uh, what the heck? 
Zisu isn't here? I just came all the way back here for nothing? As it turns out, she's up here with everyone else. There's nothing left to do now but head up to the Temple of Sinnoh, where a portal opens up and out pops Palkia. Behold the ancient wisdom! We were supposed to catch Palkia, but I accidentally one-shot it with pixie sticks. It was at this moment I realized something incredibly useful to the run. You can knock out Palkia as many times as you'd like, and get XP every single time. Then it just forces you back to attempt the battle again, and it does this over and over until you eventually capture it. So I used this to my advantage to farm XP and bully Palkia relentlessly until I was satisfied. I also found out something else pretty funny. Apparently, if you get in the middle of the battle and bother the Pokémon enough times, they'll just whack you to try and get you out of the way. Once we caught Palkia, Dialga showed up to destroy the temple, so we had to run away. But before we did, the ruler of time bestowed upon us his ancient divine wisdom. Tokyo Koopa Bargwar! Back down at the summit camp, we run into this guy again, and I'm honestly getting so tired of seeing him pop up everywhere. Like seriously, it's not even funny anymore, he just pops up and says the most aggravating lines of dialogue. Now, I wasn't worried about the final bandit fight, but for some reason, I have no idea how this happened, but Charms Gengar killed my level 77 Alpha Skewix. That same Pokemon's got two kills under its belt now. So Dark Feigned killed Gengar, then we got the Origin Ball. Kogita arrived in Jubilife Village to do some shopping, cause she's just cool like that. You gotta admire her attitude of, the world is ending, but it's okay. Volo is equally as nonchalant about this. I mean, he's got the popcorn bucket and extra large soda ready to go, treating this like he just bought tickets to Avengers Endgame or something. But now, our final fight was upon us. Our final obstacle between us and the end credits. It was Primal Dia- I mean, Origin Dialga. Whatever, it's a crazy Dialga, and our battle would be legendary. Except for the part where I died because I forgot to go to the village shrine and put my money in the offerings jar, so Arceus let Hisui get torn apart by a frenzied Dialga and a certified madman hiding in plain sight. Well, I guess that's the end, guys. It was a good run. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on my Pokemon Legends Arceus Nuzlocke Permadeath Ultra Wonder Rainbow Shiny Machiato Frappe. Tortellini Backrooms Metaverse Reverse Randomizer Run featuring Donkey from the Devil May Cry series. Or so you may think. You see, I suppose I should explain a little more about how lives work in this run. The word life isn't entirely accurate. It's more of a revive, but to avoid confusion with the in-game item by the same name, I've decided to call it a life. Rather than having three lives, Think of it as having three revives, where between your run, you can use three of these revives, meaning after your third revive is used up, you can still continue onwards. You just won't have any more revives remaining. And that's bad news for Dialga, because he's about to get his ass whooped. Okay, fine, I'll buy you the goddamn skin. Which one do you want here? All right. All right, Jesus Christ. So Cynthia bullied the god of time into submission and contained him within the origin ball. But we weren't quite done with him just yet. I also dug out my copy of Explorers of Sky and gave him an additional ass beating in an alternate dimension just to really drive my boy home. So the world was saved and the clans united and they all lived happily ever after. The end. Yeah, so this final stretch of the run is pretty straightforward. We just need to battle a bunch of legendaries, re-challenge Komodo, and gather all the remaining Arceus plates. It's mostly just a whole lot of training, though. And since my Steelix died, I replaced it with this Frostlass I caught in the Icelands, and named it Mirage. Once we head back to Kogita's house, she more or less tells us where to go, and we can challenge these legendaries in pretty much any order we want. And then, of course, there's the rematch against Komodo. So my plan is essentially to tackle them in order of most likely for one of my Pokemon to die to least likely. And the reasoning behind that is that should a Pokemon die, it's better for them to die sooner than later. That way I have more time to train up the newcomers before the final fight against Volo. 
And speaking of, he's supposed to be helping us, but instead he just ditches us to go do his own thing. And then still has the audacity to say we're gonna meet Arceus? There is no we, it's just me. So, the first challenge, battle Kamado. He has five relatively strong Pokemon, so there is a high chance of one of my Pokemon dying here. Kamado leads with Bolo. We take it out relatively quickly, but then proceed to struggle with Snorlax, whittling down its HP until he ends up using a full restore, so we have to just keep whittling it down some more. It turned into several minutes of spamming moves and potions, but eventually we did manage to knock out the Titan that is Snorlax. Karamity absolutely carried in this battle, proceeding to then knock out Clefable and Braviary. I did end up having to send out Pixie Sticks to take out Heracross just so that Calamity wouldn't hog up the spotlight for himself. And with that, we had successfully defeated Kamado with zero casualties on our team. Kamado seems to think that Cynthia is some kind of god, and that he's not too far off now, is he? But with that out of the way, our next challenge was to take on Cresselia at Moonview Arena, or as our mortal enemy likes to call it, the Flying Croissant. Well, Cresselia is indeed croissant-shaped. Well, I absolutely love the battle gimmick for when you encounter Cresselia. It's very reminiscent of those traps you would find in the underground in the original Diamond and Pearl games. But as you can see here, I was struggling quite a bit, and I wouldn't find out until later that it was because of Joy-Con Drift. All went well once we engaged in battle, though, and I managed to catch Priscilla on the second try. So, with another plate obtained, I decided to take a quick detour to train up Mirage, before heading out to Firespit Island. It was within the volcano that we heard Heatron's ancient wisdom. Somebody wrote this and got paid for it, man. So, the first attempt did not go as, uh, swimmingly as you'd expect, and I almost got killed, so I ended up having to run out of the cave so that I could attempt it again. So, second try. This'll go a lot smoother than the first one, right? Wrong! I got trapped in the tube of death, and I couldn't escape, so I had to run out of the cave again! Okay, last try. Third time's the charm, right? Okay, now what the heck is even going on anymore? I swear my camera won't stop spinning around. My movements are so janky and don't seem to correlate with the controls that I put in. I just need to run out of here. I need help. I need charms. I need Arceus. So I did. I went back to the village and prayed at the shrine, got a whole bunch of charms, and dumped all of my money into the offerings jar. So maybe now Arceus will take pity on my soul. But also, I noticed I was having really bad Joy-Con Drift, so I had to switch back to my old controllers. Which still have Joy-Con Drift, but it's a lot less than the ones that I was using just now. So, with the power of Arceus and new Joy-Con controllers, I headed back into the cave for the fourth attempt. And wouldn't you know... It went exceptionally well. I caught Heatran right away, and we got the plate. Now we could finally get off of this sweltering island and head someplace a lot cooler, like the Alabaster Icelands. And whether it was coincidence or not, after obtaining all of those shrine charms, I encountered this Sneasel that just absolutely refused to attack me, almost as if he was afraid or had some kind of respect, which is absolutely understandable. I've just never seen a Sneasel act like this before, so it was pretty funny. But I was off to take on the Pokemon that this AI cannot pronounce no matter how many times I try. But you all know who it is. And my Joy-Con controllers immediately died, so rules are rules are rules. I have to fly all the way back to the camp to save because that's the only place I can save. But I went back the next day and took care of it quickly. I then went on to conquer the three late guardians, Yuxi, Azelf, and Mesprit. With the Plate of the Lakes obtained, it was time to return to Kogia's house. She decides to mess with us a little more, but I honestly don't mind at all because just look at her. Oh god, she's perfect. It turns out this whole time she was just using one of the Arceus plates as a cutting board. But, I mean, look at her face and tell me that she didn't already know that. She definitely knew. She definitely freaking knew. Alas, we must bid our immortal grandmother goodbye because the final leg of the journey has arrived. Volo meets us at the Celestica Ruins before giving off his evil laughter, so we know something is up. Before we battle him, I need to take a detour to the Icelands to go and train again, but an hour or so into it, the RNG decides to let this outspeeding double-hit Ambipom use Mud Bomb and Land an Item Tail back-to-back, -back, killing Mirage out of nowhere. Genuinely, what the hell? But that's just Legends Arceus for you. 
Now I only had five active party members, and what I could have done is farm through a space-time distortion or train up one of the Pokémon that I still had in my roster in the pastures, but I didn't have time for that, or rather I didn't want to because I was just too impatient. So instead, I just beefed up my team and decided to take on the battle with five party members. And one last thing, a final salute to all our comrades who helped us along the way. Winter, the Starly, Sandy, the Geodude, Rock, the Graveler, Ropsan, the Rhyhorn, Pop, the Graveler, Floofs, the Togetic, Vengeance, the Rhydon, Doom, the Murkrow, Mafia Boss, a Ponchcrow, Zap, the Magnemite, Meow Meow, the Perugly, Petra, the Pachirisu, Rafe, the Dusclops, Swole, the Machoke, Edgelord, the Zoroark, Strunk, the Machamp, Cornelius, the Magnezone, Razor, the Weavile, Steelix, the Steelix, and Mirage, the Frostlass. Every battle, every challenge, every death had led up to this very moment. It was finally time for Cynthia to fulfill her destiny and take on her rabid great-great-great-great-grandfather. This was it, and our battle would be legend- <sighs>no no don't get me wrong i didn't actually battle him i didn't actually lose you see i had a special wardrobe change in mind for this particular battle and i kind of forgot to change into it so there was absolutely no way i was going to do this battle without looking epic as hell now i may be fashionably late but the stage is all set let's go so Volo's acting pretty sus, and then, uh, oh god, he starts taking his clothes off. Oh, thank goodness, he's just evil. Bruh, look at this dude, look at his hair. But no, seriously, can you imagine how that must have went down? Like, he just starts stripping his clothes off, and you're just standing there like, uh, <laughs> hey, yo, I get that I'm your favorite customer, but, uh... All right, all right, I swear, no more messing around, this is serious. This is it. This is the final battle. We finally made it. It's time. Let's go. For real this time. He leads with Spiritomb. We send out Dark Feigned. So far, we have the advantage. Dark Feigned immediately outspeeds and sends off two Shadow Balls, taking out Spiritomb. Volo sends out Lucario, who then hits us twice with a bullet punch and a close combat, but it isn't enough to take us down. We switch out to Maelstrom, who knocks him out with a flamethrower. Breeze goes out onto the battlefield and knocks out Roserade easily, which I don't have footage for, but he quickly sends out Arcanine, who outspeeds with an agile style followed by a strong style rock slide, and that ends up killing Breeze, our second Pokemon that we ever caught in the entire run. Good game. We sent out Calamity to deal with Arcanine, then Volo sends out his ace, Togekiss, so I send out my ace, another Togekiss. Then he just strikes a pose. Pixie Sticks asserted his dominance, but his Garchomp has Iron Head, so I have to switch out to Dark Feigned. And that was the right move because Dark Feigned annihilated Garchomp. We won! Or did we? Yeah, but uh, I have a little bit of a game theory, so uh, please let me know if you see this too. I'm not crazy, right? Like, I, I am not crazy, right? He even does the same face. Dark Fang once again leads, and I thought we were off to a great start. Dark Fang attacked twice, but I didn't anticipate that Giratina would also get to attack twice, and then Dark Fang fell. Fly high, little champ. I sent out Maelstrom to stall for a bit and chip away up the HP before switching out to Pixie Sticks and taking out Giratina with Moonblast, but uh, oh no, what's this? Giratina said bet, he's not done with us yet. Oh no, far from it, he switches out into his origin form and we've still got a long ways to go. Dude goes for the Shadow Force, tearing open a space-time hole right in front of Pixie Sticks to strike him, but it's not enough to take him down. But then, Giratina suddenly loses his will to fight? He has an epiphany and realizes that him and Cynthia are just meant to be. No one of this Volo crap. Nah, forget him. Who needs him? And Bolo isn't taking this very well. In fact, he looks kinda jealous. 
friendship ended with Volo. Now Cynthia is my best friend. We just needed to keep up this charade for a little while longer. It was a close call with Maelstrom, but he did eventually land the finishing blow, thus defeating Garatina, marking the end of the run. Let's just hope Volo has health insurance because he's going to need a lot of therapy after this. Oh, he tried it. <laughs> Volo asks Cynthia if she has a dream, but she says no just to piss him off. That seems to strike a chord with him and trigger his hot topic phase. Volo leaves rather unceremoniously, leaving Cynthia to assert her dominance one final time. And that was it. We have officially completed the Pokemon Legends Arceus Monochrome Nuzlocke. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I can't even believe how much fun I had during this run. It was an absolute blast, and I seriously hope that other people try to do this with the rule set that I've created. I once again want to give thanks to Eleven Labs, a website that lets you mask your voice with AI, which I've been using for this entire video. I seriously hope you all enjoyed my video. This is the longest video I've ever made in my entire life. It was an incredibly challenging run and I can't possibly think of any other way to make it more difficult than it already was.